Well, good morning, Riverwood. It's good to be with you this morning. So it was a Friday night, and my sons were home from college. And as good college students from home, coming home, they brought their laundry with them. And so we were doing laundry, and about 10 p.m., we hear this clanging noise. Something happened to the dryer. All chaos ensued in the Tawny household. The dryer has broken. With all of this wet laundry, what to do? Well, uh, fast forward the story to the next morning. Uh, My wife and I were at Lowe's at 8 a.m., looking to replace the dryer. So we had purchased one. It was in the back of our vehicle. I'm driving home, and I had this thought. How hard is it really to repair an old dryer? I had that thought. I mean, we had the old backup in the back of the vehicle, but I was thinking, how hard is it to repair? So I called some friends, not available. All right, so then I turned to the mother of all information of do-it-yourself. That would be? YouTube. That's right, YouTube. So I then go and purchase a new dryer belt. I bring it home, and with the help of my son, not too much longer, we got it working again. All right, and so um, who here has replaced a dryer belt? I feel like I am now in like an elite club. (laughs) I feel like I've entered into something really special. Um, But it's interesting because it went from, you know, something that was broken, something that was fixed. And it was simply uh, something that I didn't know that now I do. It's interesting how those little moments make you feel like, like accomplishments and it felt so good to return that other dryer and save all that money and all of that. Well, going from things you don't know to things you know, we all experience that. And whether it's knowing how to knit a sweater, whether you know how to do trigonometry, whether you know how to cook a turkey, whatever it might be, there is something satisfying about not knowing Um, and then going to knowing. But here's my question. What if the thing that you would now know were much more significant than saving just a few hundred dollars? What if what you would know would have eternal consequences? And let me ask this question. If it was that important, wouldn't you want to know? And if it was that weighty and that important... Wouldn't you want others to know? That is going to be our conversation this morning from the book of Acts. We're going to see a story about not knowing something to then knowing and why it matters and why it matters to everybody in this room. And many times when sermons happen, people come up to me afterwards and they'll say something like, I feel like you are talking to me. God's word is going to say something to you. It's going to speak something to you today. And whether you're 10 years old or whether you're 99 years old, (laughs) you're in this room. The Lord wants to speak something to you from his word. This is written by These words that I'm holding, they're written by men under the inspiration of God. He is the true author of these words. He used human beings to do so. And that's why we examine, because we want to hear from the Lord. All right, so if you have your Bible, we're going to continue in our story in the book of Acts. And so far, we have been in this just a few chapters, a couple chapters, and we see the, the theme is on mission for the gospel. On mission, on mission. It started in Jerusalem, and now it is expanding. It's going to expand. And so, so far, we're still kind of seeing the narrative in Jerusalem. Uh, God's plan so far is to use imperfect people for his mission. People who witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ are now empowered by the Holy Spirit. And now we see the, the word getting out and this mission going forth. And so last week we studied the template of what uh, the first church looked like. We called it um, this thing that we're all persevering in. 
church, the local church. We're persevering in the apostles' teaching, in this thing called koinonia, the breaking of bread, the prayers. All of that was last week. All right, so last week we ended with chapter 2, and this is how it ended. It, it, the, the text ended, and the Lord kept adding to their number day by day. Now we move into chapter 3, and it begins this way. Scene, this first scene begins this way. Chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. All right, let me set the scene for you. Uh, The church has been established, but the early church fathers... uh, Peter and and John, they were also in this transitionary moment where they were also adhering to the the prayer schedule of Judaism. Three times a day, you would go. And so this was the 3 p.m. prayer time. And so on this specific day, there is a man who was not able to walk, it says right here in the text, from birth, who was carried to the temple gates in hopes to receive alms. All right, he's trying to receive donations of money, if you're not familiar with alms. But not only was this man without money, but because of this, we'll call it malady, this thing he had from birth, it most likely precluded him from serving as a priest in the temple, but it also most likely precluded him from actually ever entering into the temple. The Old Testament law had had laws against this, and so this was probably his plight. Now think about this for a moment. He, he lived the entirety of his life never knowing what happened on the inside of the temple area. As people would always go in for prayer three times a day, he wasn't going in. And he was just reduced to being there asking for alms, for money. Now, in a modern day context, what would it look like to never enter into the community of church? Would that be something that would disappoint you? Would that be something you would would miss? How difficult would that be? And if you're thinking, I don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't know if I'd miss it that much. You missed last week's sermon. (laughs) Go back. Uh, It's a big deal to enter into this space called the local church. All right. So the word alms, uh, as this man is now trying to collect, in the, in the original language, it's very interesting, it also is translated a lot of times as the word mercy. Uh, mercy is, is simply a word there where you're receiving help when you're in a time where you're hurting. You're receiving help. There's mercy being shown to you because you are hurting. And the ancient word is the same then noun of alms. For people who are hurting, this lame man, he's receiving something um, in his hurt. But as we continue in the story, something beautiful is about to happen at the beautiful gate. You know this is the name of the gate. Something unbelievable is about to happen that this man can't even see coming that will change his life. This is the exciting part of the story. Now verse 3. He's not aware of anything to happen. Now verse 3. Let's continue on. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive mercy, alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixes his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold. This is why he's there. All right, let's continue on. But what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. 
And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for mercy, for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. A day when the lame will walk and leap. Now, 500 years before the prophet Isaiah, he spoke of these kinds of moments that would happen. Listen to these words. Isaiah would say, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. That day is coming! It's coming! And it's happening. At the beautiful gate, the lame is leaping for joy. Jesus Christ, a little bit before, right before this moment when he was on earth, he, he spoke of these things as well. In, in the Gospel of Luke, volume one, it's recorded. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind will receive their sight. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. And so for the lame man, a miracle has taken place to um, attest this new era, like to prove, like these are things that we're seeing Peter and and John do, it reminds us of, oh, yes, Jesus did very similar things. Oh, like that moment where the lame man was lowered through the roof. You remember? Yes, we remember all those. And now we're seeing very similar things. These guys must be with Jesus. And what he did, yes, this is very, very similar. That's why these things are happening. But for this man, his life changed because he now had access to the temple, to hear the story, the deep story of the mercy of God, to enter into a relationship with him is possible. It, this is wonderful. This man was receiving way more than gold and silver. Beautiful. All right, so all of this certainly caught the attention of the crowd. Verse 10 tells us of a similar reaction that we've seen before from the crowd. Remember, in the last chapter, they were amazed at this language thing that was happening, and they had their own thoughts on that. These people probably a little tipsy here. I don't know what you can't know how else to explain this. Well, we see this here again, and just like before. Peter entered into that moment of wonder and amazement and perplexity with a sermon. We all love sermons, right? We do, right? Okay, right. So we're going to see that again. Peter is now capitalizing on this moment to use words. Let's keep reading verse 11. This is what, where we see the beginning of this sermon. While he, this is the the lame man, he clinging, he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? I'm one of those weird people that likes to read sermons. I study a lot about sermons. I like to, I have lots of books on sermons. And I, so I'm a, a student of sermons. And here's what I'll tell you in all of the things that I've, I've learned about sermons that great sermons are always linked with great questions. Great sermons always have great questions. And sometimes the best sermons 
have the questions asked that don't always connect all of the dots for the listener so that the listener can engage in deeper ways with their life with a question. Jesus did this all the time when he would ask questions like this. Um, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? Well, that's a perplexing question. Or uh, which is easier to say to this person, your sins are forgiven or, or pick up your mat and walk? Well, which one's easier? Uh, hmm, that's perplexing. So Jesus was the master at asking great questions that would probe to deeper places. And so asking the right questions is really actually difficult, but it's very important. And so that's what Peter is doing here. He's taking a page from the, the teaching playbook of Jesus, and he starts off with an overarching question. Here's basically the question. How do you not know? See, we're talking about knowing and not knowing. How do you not know? Like, how do you not know how to do this? How do you not know what happened here? All of these not knowing. How, how do you not know? It's very, it was a very bold question. How do you not know how this man was healed? And immediately he's grabbing their attention in this way because Really, he's, he's leaning into something that's bold. People never want to be on the side of not knowing. It's almost like embarrassing. Like if I were to say, I don't know how to, try, how to change a dryer vent belt, or you probably would be like, oh my goodness, what kind of person is he? What kind of guy is that? It's, there's embarrassment and not knowing. And it can be about anything. We don't like to admit we don't know. And Peter's coming right out of the gate with a bold question. How do you not know? They should have known. They should have known. And it was unsettling for them. They should. They had the material of the prophets. They knew Isaiah. They, they've heard Jeremiah. They, they've heard these things. How do you not know? And if this was unsettling, which I'm sure it was, Peter drives even deeper in the don't know Let's keep reading in verse 13. He's, he's going to drive deeper. Notice what he says in verse 13. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man, the layman, this perfect health in the presence of you all. And so the question has now evolved. How do you not know has now evolved into how do you not know Jesus? See how Peter did that? How do you not know how this happened? How do you not know Jesus was the one who healed this man? In fact, he says, you were the ones who delivered him over to the Roman authorities. They were the ones who denied him in the presence of Pilate. They wanted, Bar give us Barabbas the murderer. And they had Jesus killed. How do you not know Jesus? And he, said, he uses these titles, the Holy One, the, the Righteous One, the one who is the author of life. For if they really knew him, their actions would have reflected this deeper truth of, of knowing him. This past week, I've been reflecting on these specific titles of, of Jesus, the righteous one, the holy one. But the one that has really grabbed my attention this week is when he is described as the author of life. 
And this really points us into a myriad of conversations we could have. How he is the author of life. We could talk about the end of life and how precious life is. We could talk about the topic of suicide. Again, the preciousness of, of life. We could talk about even life being expended at the, at, at, in the things of war and the things you just maybe have seen on the TV this morning. But we could also talk about how precious life is at the very beginning. The very beginning. Psalm 139, in the womb, I have formed you. I have knit you together. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Wow, it's amazing. And our culture wants us to keep having conversations of how cheap life is. I want you to know God's word says it is so precious. And our, our culture wants us to have opinions and, and even in ballot boxes wants us to enter into conversations like this. May we be the people who always side with the author of life. In these conversations, may we side with him. And if you think, I'm, if you think wow, I think he's making a political statement, you are absolutely wrong. I am making a statement about biblical truth. May we be the people who side with the author of life in these things. All right. All right, so Peter, he's, he's telling them this very hard truth that proves that they don't know who he is. And really, they are on the outside of knowing. They, they don't know him. They don't know Jesus. And they had assumptions and speculations. Oh, it must be your piety. It must be some kind of magic going on. Is that what's going on? And he addresses them to say, no, it is not. And I'm guessing there are some here in this room right here, that are also wrestling with some kind of misunderstanding of who you think Jesus is. Maybe you, you don't know who he is and you really don't care because you're just being drugged here by some family member and you don't want to be here. Or maybe you, it doesn't matter to you, but let me tell you, the consequences of not knowing Jesus Christ are huge. We're not talking about a few hundred dollars that you'll be out. Eternity hangs in the balance of either knowing or not knowing the author of life, Jesus Christ. But look, just like the lame man who didn't see any kind of hope or any point or any kind of mercy coming, Peter is about to speak in his sermon of, of good news. For those who have gathered to hear, they've heard the hard questions. Now he wants to give them something that they can know. So I'm hoping no one has left the room because what he is about to say is going to be very exciting. Let's pick up in verse 17. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer. Thus he fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. The word ignorance right there in verse 17, you could make a note there. It's literally the word unknown. In the, in the Greek language, you can you put the word no, but then you put a, a letter in front of it, and it means it's the opposite. And so this its sentence would be a little clunky, but it could read, I know that you acted in what you didn't know. 
That's how the the sentence really reads. I know that you acted in what you didn't know. But then he wants to make very clear of what they can know about Jesus. Don't live in ignorance. Ignorance isn't your excuse. Just being I don't know isn't, isn't the answer. And so he then walks them through something very, very important. The first is this need to, he says, repent. We've heard this word before in Acts. Uh, Peter has been using it often. It's a turning 180 degrees away from, from what? From sin, from the brokenness that you have in your heart. He's saying, repent, turn. And as you turn, you're taking a step towards the Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only one, I love the phrase there, he can blot out. I love this because I am someone who leans into this blotting out imagery that is being used here. In the ancient world, this was about writing and ink they would use. And in the ancient context, you have this papyrus surface and you would have ancient inks. And ancient inks didn't have all of the fancy acids that would allow it to be soaked into uh, the papyrus right away. And so you had to let it sit. And there was a process to that. And what he's leaning into is this metaphor is, imagine things were being written about your past. Guess what can happen? the ink can be wiped away, blotted out. It's it's way too good to be true. Yes, your sin, what you're about, you're like, no, but I have this in my past. I've heard this time and time again. There is something to link of hope here that Jesus steps in. The power of Jesus steps in. And when you surrender your life to him, he has the ability to stretch deep into your past and just like that ink, wipe it away. If you need an Old Testament reminder of this, it doesn't get any better than Psalm 103. Look at these words. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, So great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. We believe that, right? This is the hope we have that Jesus Christ enters in. When we enter into a relationship with him to say, I need help, we repent and he blots out the sin and shame. He handles it for us. All right, so not only does, he, does Jesus speak something to our past, it gets even better. Notice the next phrase. Verse 20. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Right now, in a world that is filled with war, in a world that is filled with brokenness everywhere, you, you turn with evil there and there. And then even in our own lives, the brokenness of relationships, the brokenness of maybe estranged children or whatever it might be, it's just so difficult. All that we can also in the midst of this broken world right now, this is a, a, a promise for right now that there can be times of refreshment for your soul right now because the Lord is present with you. When you surrender to him, the Holy Spirit is now planted inside of you. The presence of the Lord is, is right here in your life. He is with you. That's the greatest thing. At times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. He is with us. Here's a great reminder from the Old Testament. Psalm 23, finish the phrase. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with. He's with us. A relationship with Jesus Christ. It deals something with our deep past of blotting out, but there can be even refreshment, refreshment in, with the presence of the Lord as we walk with him. It gets even better. Verse 21, notice this phrase. 
may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things. Until the time for restoring all the things of what Peter is talking about is that knowing Jesus is now extended into the future. It extends into the future. The moment when he will come and make all things new. The moment in the future where there will no longer be, read the book of Revelation, no more pain, no more tears, no more brokenness. There will be a time where we will see him face to face. Hope, the, the hope of Jesus extends into the future until that day, until the time of restoring all the things. That is the good news of the gospel. When you enter into a relationship with him, he has something to say to your past, for your present, and the future to come. And so Peter, he, he's preaching this, that you have to know him. You have to. How do you not know him? How could you not want to know him? Here is your opportunity to know him. And he's corresponding this whole narrative to what happened to the lame man who never saw mercy coming. He just wanted gold and silver. But yet he, yet he received something far greater. Jesus Christ wants to be the far greater thing. He wants to enter in and offer you a mercy that you don't deserve. Help for your hurting soul that only he can answer. Something that will address the past, the present, and the future. And so in the moment of the text, it's interesting, the sermon is lingering, and the question then is, what will the people do with these words? The people who are going from unknowing, would they know? Would they enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, those are always the things that plague those who deliver sermons. Who's really listening? You should see me on Sunday afternoon. I'm just like, I don't even know if that was worth it. I don't even know. What's the point? We just say words. Is the spirit moving in people's lives or not? These are the things that... Peter is now left at the foot of those who are the listeners. And so this morning he leaves these same words. I leave these same words with you as well. And the first set of questions is really is, do you know Jesus Christ? We live in a world where we're fill, it's filled with gold and silver, and many times we're satisfied with that. But I, you need to hear that that will never even begin to touch the effectiveness of what Jesus Christ can do for your soul. Gold and silver. <sighs> but Jesus Christ has something for eternity. Do you know him? It's funny how Peter assumed, like, how do you not know him? I could say the same thing. People come in and out of churches all the time. How can you not know Jesus? It's possible. Do you, have you actually surrendered your, your life to him? Start there. Because this is really important. The next set of questions leans into, if this is so important, don't we want the world to know this? How can we contain the good news of the gospel? It just explodes with, with something of hope for a world that is so broken. And the constant mantra you're going to keep hearing over and over again is, is that the gospel is going to go forth by words, with language. And here's the great encouragement for those who think they have nothing to say. You see that Jesus Christ has something to speak into people's past, something to say to their present, and something to say about their future. Now, how many conversations can you enter into with that kind of lead? Endless. Endless amounts of conversation. May we continue to, to gain a boldness to share what the world needs to hear. 
Maybe somebody at work, and you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to enter into a conversation about their past because they have no hope. Or maybe they're walking through something right now that is overwhelming. And you're going to insert conversation. Whatever it, wherever the Lord is leading, may we be attuned to his spirit. How is the Lord challenging us individually to gain a confidence with words that will speak Jesus? We're going to sing that song very shortly. Speaking Jesus. How do we speak Jesus to a culture, to a world that needs to hear? And so I'm going to pray for us. And if you're someone who is who's really wrestling with, I'm not quite sure if I do know him. We're going to have people around the room whom you can pray with. And you can ask them. I want, you can just come up to them and say, I want to know who Jesus Christ is. Can you pray with me? Or maybe you have some other request or something else you're wrestling with. But may we be challenged as people who are like the lame beggar who have, who have been given something way more than we ever deserve. Let's go to the Lord. Dear God, we give you thanks, and, and we're thankful for your word that challenges us. Um, we, are, we are the people laying down in front of the temple, and we're powerless, and we're in deep need of mercy. And you answer that in ways that we can't even wrap our minds around. We just want this or that, and yet you give us so much more through your son, Jesus Christ. And may we be those people who, who live that, who know who the Savior is and want to make him known to the world around us. And so give us words, give us boldness, give us um, confidence um, to do exactly that. And so... Even in our worship moments uh, as we end, may you be glorified. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.